Um, hello, everyone. This is going to be a team presentation between myself and the technician at the back. Um, and that is because if you're feeling a little bit sleepy right now, it is getting to be towards the end of the afternoon. I just want to let you know I have a few videos <laughs> to perk things up a bit. Um, so the work that I'm going to present today is um, has been done by the um, research team, largely by the research team that I manage. Um, I'm going to show at the beginning some work from the satellite remote sensing work that is led by C Dr. Chris McClendon. And there is a poster on that work, as was mentioned, across from the registration desk. Um, the modeling work that I will present has been led by Dr. Paul McCarr and the team listed there. And um, so I really, my role is just to manage the program. And um, so the work you see is thanks to the brilliant minds of the people I'm fortunate enough to manage. Uh, so with that, um, today I'm going to give you a brief snapshot of some of the work we have done to date to develop and apply two different tools for quantifying the spatial and temporal trends in air pollutants in the oil sands region. The first of these tools is satellite remote sensing. In this case, using an instrument on the OMI satellite, which can measure concentrations of NO2 and SO2 in the atmosphere. Um, here, uh, what I'm going to show you, oops, a little bit too soon there on the technical. <laughs> I'll say play when I'm ready. Um, so here I'm going to show you a video that shows the trend in, SO, in sorry, nitrogen dioxide concentrations over the oil sands region from the period of October 2005 to May 2013. And so what you're going to see is a running average. And the small map on the bottom is a um, section of Alberta that has um, Edmonton at the bottom. I have arrows pointing to the different spots four power plants and the refineries. And above that is the oil sands mining area. And the box, the oil sands mining area is blown up in the larger box. And um, so for the sake of uh, time, and I'm just gonna run through this once, so I suggest that you focus on the bullseye and what you'll see is how nitrogen dioxide concentrations have changed over this period. So now we can hit play. So now we're in 2007, 2008, I missed 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, and then 2013. So the next slide um, is results from applying the satellite to look at changes in SO2 concentrations in the region between 2005 and 2013. So the map shows the spatial trends in SO2 levels over the region between these two time periods. If there has been an increase between those time periods in the concentration of SO2 measured in the atmosphere, it is denoted in red. And if there's been a decrease, it is denoted in blue and the intensity of the color reflects the intensity of the change. So what we have observed is that there is and has been between those two time periods an increase in SO2 concentrations in the air, uh, in the oil sands area and downwind. There has been a decrease in concentrations um, around the coal-fired power plants, which uh, aligns very nicely with the uh, mitigation that has happened over that time period. And there is I have to um, have an arrow on flimflon because there's one spot where there's a huge decrease in SO2 emissions and that was due to the closure of the flimflon smelter. So the other tool that we use to, that we've applied under JOSM to the oil sands to look at spatial and temporal trends in air pollutants is a high resolution version of EC's operational air quality forecast model which is called GEMMAC. The work that I'm going to present here utilizes the model-ready version of the Joint Oil Sands Emissions Inventory that George Marson spoke about yesterday, and that will soon be available on the portal. Descriptions of the model in 
including evaluation of its performance to date, are available in another report that has been released um, to, or that we prepared for AESRD and is tentatively titled Delivery of Environment Canada's GEMMAC 2.5 Kilometer Resolution um, Annual Simulation Results to AESRD. I'm sure we'll put a better title on it when we put it on the portal. Um, there will be a number of scientific journal publications that will emerge from the work we've done under JOSM that will describe the model and its performance. However, in the interim, if you're interested, the papers listed below are, describe evaluations of the versions of the model that we used for this project. So with that, the purpose of the high resolution air quality modeling project under JOSM was to evaluate and apply a comprehensive high resolution air quality forecast model to the region as a tool to quantify the relationship between air pollutant emissions, air quality, and the condition of the environment. The project is a key integration piece in the air quality science plan that was developed for the oil sands region. This is because the numerical air quality model is the means by which we weave together information that is discrete in time and space. For instance, the, measure, the type of information you get from measurement studies, from monitoring sites, from emissions measurements. And we wanted to weave that together to provide a scientifically robust description of air quality and deposition that is continuous in time and space. So in other words, the model is used to fill in the gaps. Furthermore, this tool allows us to predict past and future air quality under different emission, weather, and climate scenarios. And in an atmosphere that is complex, the model also allows us to attribute the contribution of air pollutant emission sources to local, regional, and global air quality. So you may be asking, well I hope you're asking, if not I'm asking you to ask, <laughs> what do you mean by weaving together discrete pieces of information to provide a scientifically robust description of air quality in time and space? So what the air quality model does is it takes pieces of information like emissions, landscape characteristics, all the meteorological variables, all the chemical variables, and combines these using mathematical representations of the physics and chemistry that drive the weather and air pollutant chemistry. And these process rep representations themselves are the products of discrete measurements that have been done to understand and evaluate the, these physical and chemical relationships. So we weave this all together in the form of a numerical model so that we can better understand levels of air pollutants between monitoring stations and continuously through time. So an example of the outcome of this process is depicted in the maps on the bottom of the slide. These maps I just plucked out of the operational um, air quality forecast from last week. So they're from uh, 12 Greenwich Mean Time on February 17th. And the map on the left shows the NO2 concentrations measured at monitoring stations across the domain for the operational model, which is North America. And what you can see is, or at least Canada and the US to be correct, um, what you can see is that the measurements are sparse across the landscape and um, look disproportionately large here because they have to make the dots big enough so that you can see them. Um, the map on the right is the product of the um, operational forecast model for the same time for the same chemical and it gives you a value for NO2 concentrations across that domain that is continuous. So it really helps to fill in the gaps in our understanding of uh, the, the um, spatial uh, trends in, in air quality. So why is it important to go to all this effort to understand levels of air pollutants continuously in time and space? So why do we bother? Well, one reason is because human and environmental exposure to air pollutants and deposition is continuous in time and space. So if you want to truly assess or relate the impact of air pollutant exposure on human health or the environment, you need to have um, an understanding of exposure that is continuous in time and space. But there are many other reasons why we do this work, and some of those reasons 
are to enable us to answer key scientific questions and some key JOSM questions, namely, what are the levels of and trends in, sorry, air pollutants and acid deposition in the region? Where should air mon monitoring sites be located to best capture the heterogene heterogeneity of air quality? And what is the relative contribution of emissions from oil sands activities to air quality in the region? So to, um, towards these endpoints under JOSM, we have been delivering the following activities. So we developed an improved emission inventory for the oil sands region, that was again under um, George, to drive the model. We set up a high resolution um, 2.5 kilometer uh, grid square version of EC's air quality forecast model, and we've been evaluating the model. So to give you a taste, give you a sense of what a 2.5 kilometer resolution air quality model driven by the JOSM oil sands inventory looks like, I have the following, following illustrative video. So this video shows the model output put for sulfur dioxide. Specifically, it shows the transport and dry deposition of SO2 from emission sources um, within and outside of the domain. The yellow clouds are plumes of SO2 at a concentration greater than three parts per billion. When you watch the video, you will see the plumes disappear. So when they disappear, that is for three reasons. Um, either the SO2 is reacted with other chemical constituents in the air and is turned into something else, so then we stop showing it. So those would be, for instance, sulfuric acid for acid deposition or um, PM, so particle matter. Um, or it has disappeared because the concentration has dissipated to less than three parts per billion. Or it has disappeared from the plume because it has been dry deposited on the landscape. So during the video, you will see the color of the ground change in accordance with the net accumulation of SO2 dry deposition over the, the period of this video. So as for the period of the video, just so we don't start the video, Daisy. <laughs> It is the four-week period in 2013 when we carried out the uh, intensive measurement campaign that Stuart just described. And um, so during that campaign, the model was used to guide the airplane so that it knew where to fly to capture the plumes. Um, so data from this campaign is now being used both to evaluate this model and to inform improvements to it. And just to give you some context, the output that I'm showing you is one chemical that the model outputs, but it actually outputs 138 different air pollutants. So now we can start the, the video. Okay, so what you're watching is the transport and fate of SO2, as I mentioned. Um, I don't, oh, I guess I do have, oh, I have to point it here. Okay, so here's the oil sands region. Over here you have uh, coal-fired power plants. Over here you have conventional oil and gas predominantly. Up here you have a combination of conventional and unconventional oil and gas. Down in the south you have coal-fired power plants and the emissions inventory used outside of the oil sands region for Canada is 2006, so you still have flimflon. Anyway, there are many things I love about this video. Uh, one of the things is that it takes a phenomena that is largely invisible to us, since most plumes after a few hundred meters, you don't see them anymore. So ta-da, it's all disappeared. Um, but it hasn't, <laughs> and you can see, get a sense of where it goes and how it moves with the weather. And um, what you see there is the legacy of the dry deposition from that four-week period, so it also gives you a sense of uh, how the air pollutants from a plume that is really quite narrow end up dispersed across the landscape. So the next video I have to show you is to design to give you a sense of how air pollutant emissions in the region contribute to air quality in the region. So to do this, we have taken the model output for PM2.5, ozone, and NO2, and used and calculated the air quality health index, which is a running three-hour average for the same period as the last video, or the, this video is for the same period as the last video. 
So the AQHI is a tool for communicating the potential risk from short-term exposure to air pollutants. So the index is communicated on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 representing the greatest potential risk. So I um, will show this video in a minute, but um, like all the videos, there's little elements that I that one can drive from them that is interesting. And what I find most interesting with this video is that it really shows the influence of the combined influence of weather and emissions on air quality. Over this four week time period, the emissions are generally uh, consistent, but the impact on air quality, as you can see, will changes dramatically. And if you could start the video. I'm like four more minutes. So you can see how air quality in the region is impacted by the, the combined emissions from inside and outside the domain. Although in this case, um, for PM 2.5 and NO2, it's predominantly from emissions within the domain. And you can also see how air quality, it moves. <laughs> And I will add the weather that is driving this model is a very accurate represent representation of the weather because it's the weather forecast reinitialized with real data every six to 12 hours. Okay, so um, the rest of it I will really go quickly. Um, so another one of our JOSM activities was to use the model to determine levels of and trends in ambient air pollutants and acid deposition in the region. So um, here we have an example. We've been running the model um, for w well over a year now. We archive all of the outputs so that we can create products like the one I'm showing here. So here is an example of the outcome of this work for total annual deposition of sulfur and nitrogen for the period of September 2013 to October 2014. And so what this is really showing is total acid deposition on the landscape. And this information and products like this will be used to evaluate critical load exceedances for the region. So what that means in normal words is this information will be used to determine if levels of acid deposition are currently exceeding the capacity of the ecosystem to buffer these acids without damaging the plants and animals that live there. And finally, um, what another one of our activities is to use the model output to support assessments to, to, to determine where air quality monitoring sites should be located. And this, I'll just very quickly say, what we do is we take, um, well, actually, I will say, to support the determination of where air quality monitoring sites might best be located, we have provided air quality model output data to AESRD for their network assessment. And we've also, you, we also use it in-house. Um, so just quickly, what we do is we run a statistical analysis that looks at um, the different air pollutants and um, how they correlate with one another. So you look at various sites and look at the correlation. And if they're highly correlated with a low mean difference, you're essentially measuring very the same thing, and if they have low correlation coefficients and high mean difference, you're measuring things that are different, so you're capturing the heterogeneity. So just as an example, for our federal network that looks at um, air and precipitation chemistry at a regional scale, we did uh, ran this analysis to see if we needed another site um, near Buffalo Narrows where that arrow is. So we ran the stats, and the outcome of that was that measurements at the two sites we have, Pine House Lake and Flat Valley, well represent regional air quality in the vicinity of Buffalo Narrows. So when we ran the analysis for our own network determinations, in this particular case, an additional regionally representative station um, at this location would not have added a lot of new information to, uh, on regional air quality. So finally, our, last, our next steps under JOSM for 2015-16 are to continue to develop the best available model-ready emissions inventory for use in the, in, uh, for driving this model. 
Um, also, to use the model output to assess um, assessments of network design and to do comparative analyses of the model output with the comprehensive air quality data sets that were generated from the field campaign, which will both uh, validate or evaluate the model and um, will give us the information to improve the model where that proves necessary. And finally, the ultimate um, application of this model in the JOSM context is to use the output to support the assessment of cumulative environmental impacts in the region. And that is it. Thank you for indulging me with a couple more minutes <laughs> there. No, those videos were great. Interesting to watch. Uh, any questions? Then we can take maybe one question before. Yeah, if you'd like, come on, we'll take one question. Just a, a dumb question. I'm just a soil scientist. Um, so we're talking about uh, emissions and we're talking about transport and we're talking about deposition. Mm -hmm. So do I understand correctly, so you're making air measurements, concentrations, and then using the deposition velocity then to calculate deposition? Is that how that goes? Because I know the deposition velocity of aerosols depends profoundly on the size of those aerosols. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm gonna ask you is, there's a lot of dust in the oil sands region, and those are relatively large particles. So my question is scavenging, and then part two of my question is, how do you do the ground truthing, like on the ground, to actually measure that deposition to compare that with your model deposition? Okay, so a couple of, I mean, this is where Paul would really blind you with the science on a question like that, but I <laughs> will not. Um, so there, it, there are a number of parameterizations in the model for deposition. So there are parameterizations for dry deposition and there are parameterizations for wet deposition. So the model is um, coupled with the weather model. So for things like wet deposition, um, the whole precipitation cycle in the weather forecast model is what would ultimately um, drive the wet deposition, snow, sleet, rain, uh, for the chemistry part of the model. For dry deposition, the model is parameterized to account for different particle sizes, different chemicals, different reactions. So it is, um, it is quite well resolved to account for the different um, physical and chemical properties of the pollutants that we are modeling to the ground. And as for evaluation, um, we, have, we do have a, a precip network that provides us with data on wet deposition of chemicals. So that um, data is used to evaluate model performance. And for dry deposition, um, that one I would ha I have to ask, uh, would have to ask one of my scientists exactly how they go about doing that. So that one might be a follow-up question with me via email and uh, I will get you the definitive answer on that one. Great, thank you. Okay. All right. Good. All right, thank you very much.